there's something absolutely enchanting about Shandong province. Now we're on part of the Grand Canal. This is a restored, recreated ancient town, the town of Tai Ajong. And I'm dressed up like a king. We've got the beautiful boat lady here who's going to serenade us shortly. So many magical moments ahead in this episode of Charming China. Hello, I'm Greg Granger. Ahead, ancient river towns. The modern craze of dressing retro. Praising the pomegranate. And climbing a sacred mountain to be blessed by the first rays of a new day. All ahead as we set out to discover a truly charming Shandong province. There's high energy aplenty as we set out to explore one of China's largest ancient cities. This athletic troupe of dragon dance performers are our introduction to Tai Zhuang, a huge complex that's been rebuilt after being destroyed by Japanese shelling in the Second World War. Today, I'm teaming up on an old-fashioned rickshaw with Chinese broadcaster Mini Sheng. Well, Mini, Tai Zhuang is just an amazing city. No matter how far I walk, I don't yeah. seem to find the ends of this. It just goes and goes. Yeah, you can see so many paveways, waterways, buildings, different architectures. It covers 20,000 square meters. So today, enjoying this, uh, this rickshaw, this, of course, we're reliving history. This village would have existed what, some 2,000 years ago in the Han Dynasty? Yeah, 2,000 years ago, there are people living in Tai Zhuang. Wherever you go in Tai Zhuang, there are performances. This masked reenactment is in front of the Temple of the Queen of Heaven. It's about a renowned Qing Dynasty Emperor Qianlong. During his fourth thousand tour, he passed through Tai Zhuang. He's very satisfied with the people's life here. So he gives the name of the first village under the heaven to Tai Zhuang. The first village under heaven. Yeah. OK. Nearby, a solo opera performance by singer Zhu Fang Li. So we have this beautiful open air theatre, performances every day by Miss Li and, and the opera that she's singing. Yeah, the opera is called Liu Qing Drama. It's yes. a kind of folk opera. It's pop especially popular in the southern part of Shandong province. Not just performances, but hands-on demonstrations as well. Miss Shen is teaching Minnie how to colour a fan. So fans, fans are such a big thing here in China. We're applying some coloured paint. Miss Chen is demonstrating how to colour a fan. Mm -hmm. And she's putting all these colours in. And yeah. I think the predominant colour is this, is going to be yeah, the yellow. the yellow one. Because you're wearing yellow. Yeah. I'm and going to put this fan into the water. Yes, yes, And yes, let's yes. the oil paint getting a big shape here. And let's see what colour you come out with. Yeah, just put it in. And maybe a little spin. I know. And you can also shake. I know Miss Chen is an expert here. There we go. Look at that. Ooh. And our very own coloured fan. Good on you. Good yeah. On you. Let's have a. <laughs> <laughs> but if Tai Zhuang is impressive by day, just wait till they turn the lights on. The entire ancient town lights up. with this central tower, scene of a spectacular Chinese tradition of molten iron fireworks. It's a 500-year-old pyrotechnic practice known as Da Shu Hua, where red-hot steel is fired into the air. One tradition that Minnie and I agree to take part in is to dress in traditional clothing, 
traditional hanfu. hanfu clothes. And so that's the thing, that's the rage yeah. these days here in China to dress up, yeah. to parade the streets. We're going to do a night and tour it's tonight. It's trendy among young people. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. All right, well, let's head off on our tour. Yeah, let's head on our tour. Strolling Taiyuan by night is a real treat. But better still, take to one of the canals in a riverboat, steered and serenaded by this delightful boat lady. Well, what talent we've got here. Our boat lady, her name? Yeah, her name is Jia Song Yi, and she has been working for this uh, for about eight years. So in those eight years, she's learned really good skills. She's a skilled boatswoman, mm -hmm. manoeuvring this uh, oar here, a lovely calm paddler, but she's also a singer. Yeah, she could give us a scene performance. It's a stirring experience with yet another onshore performance to end our time this evening in Taiyuan. Another major claim to fame here in the city of Zhangzhuang is the delicious fruit, the pomegranate. The countryside here is covered with pomegranate plantations. The pomegranate. Yeah. So big here and so tasty here in Zhangzhuang. Mm. It is so sweet and it is good for antioxidants. It's very healthy. Very healthy and, of course, these plantations are the biggest in the world, are they not? Yes, and they are recognised by Guinness Book of World Records. People love it, people eat it, people sell it, and people planted since 2,000 years ago. So we are seeing acres and acres, we're seeing vast, vast crops yeah. of uh, the pomegranates here. Mm -hmm. Vast crops. It's so big, such a big industry, yeah. that they actually have a, have a conference. Yeah, and has the Pomegranate Industry Development Conference. Are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Yeah. What we witnessed is the big range of pomegranate products, such as juices, wines and flavoured honey, produced by some 30 different companies. And then we watch as farm workers separate seeds from the pomegranate fruit. Finally, we visit a plantation dedicated to producing bonsai pomegranate plants. A fitting reminder of how far this humble plant has come in the 2,000 years since it was first identified. With a population of 1.4 billion people to feed across China, considerable ground is given over to crops like this corn being harvested. The whole process of preparing the corn for consumption can be seen around the small village of Beigushi. This village is a showcase for many crafts, including a giant stone roller used to crush the corn, a process practiced for many centuries. There's a stonemason at work here. Take a look at this teapot carved from stone. This group of women use their needleworking skills to sew shoes featuring the head of a tiger. While these two young ladies are building toys using small wooden bricks. Puzzles made out of wood have been a tradition here for two and a half thousand years, thanks to the work of inventor and craftsman Lu Ban. We've travelled on to a place dedicated to him and his interlocking puzzles, known as the Lu Ban Lock. It's a brain-teasing puzzle known around the world. Twelve wooden pieces assembled here by Hao Li, inheritor of Lu Ban's lock-making techniques. So the Lu Ban Lock these days is famous. I've seen this in uh, my home country of Australia. Mm. We see the Lu Ban Lock all over the world. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Lu Ban's Lock has already been 
It became a name card of Luban culture, and it's just a representative of Eastern wisdom. Luban invented his famous lock by developing a series of tools. You can see axe, plane, drill, saw, and Luban used all the other equipment to invent the Luban lock. From the Luban lock, we prepare to meet another brilliant man born around the same time two and a half thousand years ago here in Shandong province, the philosopher and scientist known as Mosey. Such a brilliant mind. Mosey invented hundreds of practical creations, such as this hoist. He even invented toys. And the mathematical calculator, the abacus. I studied the abacus at school, way ahead of computers. Mm -hmm. Let's do a simple sum, 10 plus 15. Write it down. 10 plus 15. 10 plus 15, 25. <laughs> <It's so easy. laughs> but undoubtedly, his most visionary concepts related to space and the universe. So Mozi was also a leader in research into the universe. Yeah, at that time he started to research into the time and space. Yes. Uh, he thinks the universe is infinite. So he made that decision so long ago. Yeah. He, was, he was a leader in astrology. Mozi, the brilliant Shandong legend, remembered here in the Mozi Memorial Hall. We've moved on, we've moved on to the Shandong city of Tay An. Now there's a very sacred mountain here. We're going to climb that and watch a very, very special occurrence. Also, some shadow puppetry. Greg, welcome to Tay An, my home city. You were born here? Yeah, I was born here, I grew up here. Yeah. I'm going to show you around. Wonderful. Our goal is to reach the top of China's foremost sacred mountain, Mount Tai. It's a long, exhausting climb up the mountain, and yet every day thousands of people make that effort. Amazing thing about these pilgrims, you could call them pilgrims, mm -hmm. is that they're choosing to walk 7,000 steps from the bottom. Yeah. This shows what their fortitude and strength. Yeah, and it takes them four to five hours all the way from the bottom to here. So you can, you can see the spirit of Chinese people's endurance, resilience, and the power, the strength. OK, and now they're almost at Mount Tai. This is the third gate, is it not? Yeah, Nan Tian Gate. It means the thousand gate to the heaven. And so all these people, they're getting up to between 20 and 30,000 people on a really good day, making yeah. this massive climb. Mm -hmm. They get to the top, they sleep over under the stars, and they're there right at dawn to see the rising sun. Yeah, all waiting for the sunrise tomorrow. Walking up Mount Tai may be exhausting, but spare a thought for the porters. Their loads are often more than 50 kilograms. Finally, we reach our goal, the summit of Mount Tai, right on sunset. Well, well what an atmosphere. Something like 10,000 people this night. They do get three times that crowd on the weekends. And as you can see, the sun is about to rise. This is a very special moment. A long climb, a freezing night, and they're about to be rewarded. I can tell you a poem, it is It means that one should strive to reach the highest peak is where we are standing now. And at here, you can just look down upon all the other mountains and everything in comparison is just small. It means that you can have a sense of determination, of achievements, and you can overcome all the challenges to make it, to have the great achievements. Sunrise at the summit of Mount Tai, regarded as one of China's most breathtaking spectacles. Most importantly, Mount Tai is where Chinese emperors have made sacrificial ceremonies to the heavens, and only emperors who have great achievements are allowed to go. 
It's been an exhilarating but exhausting experience as we witness after sunrise, climbers simply collapsing, stretching out on the rocks and sleeping it all off. Our final experience in Tayan is to watch a famous shadow puppeteer. Here he is, Zhengan Farm. At 82 years old, he's still very active, building his own shadow puppets and playing many instruments to accompany his performances. Shadow puppetry is a traditional theatre form from Tayan. And Zhengan Farm is a master practitioner. The shadow puppets of Tayan as we prepare to travel to Shandong's capital city. Such beautiful, clear spring water. Water everywhere, so fresh, so clear, so pure, that the locals come here, they collect the water, they take it home as their drinking water. Now, we're in the provincial capital of Shandong province. This is the city of Jinan. Jinan, the city of springs. Showing us around the city of springs today is Minnie's friend, Angela Zhu. Black Tiger Spring is very important for Jinan local people. So you can see people line up over there. They come here every day with big containers and buckets to collect water and cook at home. Wow. Now I'm yes. seeing it everywhere. I'm seeing people putting water into the, into the actual river here, or the creek. I'm seeing people filling up at the, uh, the drinking stations. I'm seeing everybody seems to be collecting water. Yeah, and in ancient, in ancient times, Jinan people, Jinan people come here to collect water as well. And also, there was a saying for that. Uh, in Jinan, every home has spring water and every house has willow trees. You can also see the willow trees everywhere. It's very pretty. With such an abundance of water, Angela invites us to take to a riverboat to explore the canals and lakes. And taking a boat is the best way to explore Jinan. Sure is. Currently we are, currently we are on Jinan City Moat. You can enjoy the view. So we're enjoying the view, and the view we're seeing a lot of are these weeping willow trees, and they have a symbol and a significance here in Jinan. Yes, you are right, Greg. So willow trees are Jinan City tree. And also in Chinese culture, uh, willow trees represents good meanings. The willow trees bend in strong wind, but, yeah. but never break. And also, they can grow in any conditions, anywhere, just like Jinan people. Of all of Jinan 72 springs, the most revered one is Batu Springs. Uh, Batu Springs is regarded as the most famous springs among 72 springs in Jinan. Uh, not just yes. because of the natural reasons, but also because of the cultural reasons. And you can see the water from there. Yes. The yes, water yes, here yes, yes, yes. keeps our temperature as 18 degrees all year round. Just as we experienced in Taizhuang, dressing up and parading in colourful traditional clothing is all the go here in Jinan. Everywhere we go this day, we witness this trend. Even on the narrow canals, where locals love to net fish and relax. Jinan, Shandong's capital bustling with a population intent on enjoying themselves. So much more to explore in Shandong province. In our next episode, Qingdao and its famous beer museum. Weiha with its tower of happiness and abundance of fish and crabs. Yantai with its kung fu school. And Zebo big on barbecues and this amazing glass blowing factory. All ahead when next we experience charming Shandong. In the meantime, all credit goes to China's Beijing Capital Airlines. They're now flying directly from Australia to Shandong province. We enjoyed their top rate service on a flight directly from Sydney to Qingdao. They're also offering direct flights from Melbourne to Qingdao. Beijing Capital Airlines. Thanks for connecting us directly to Shandong province for this amazing experience. <laughs>